All right. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to Tom's Guitar Show. I'm Tom. They call me Guitar Tom because I'm often seen with a guitar. And they call me on the phone. They ask me, and they say, hey, man, what's your show about anyway? I say, well, it's about an hour. It's about guitar players, guitar playing, all things guitaristic. So if you want to ask me a question about, you know, how to play the guitar, the care and feeding of your guitar, what kind of guitar is right for you, you know, the number will probably appear on your screen eventually. I want to talk about some related topic like the guitarron, the sitar, guitarra, lutz, lutz, vihuelas, banjos, balaikas, bazookis, bajos, sextos, tiples, cavaquinos, banjos, banjolins, banjoleles, mandoleles, mandol, mandolins, uh, pipe organs, piccolos. Am I getting the hum out of that thing now? Getting one from somewhere. I'm getting the hum out of this thing. Sorry. Didn't mean to interrupt these things. Uh, Sometimes this guitar hums on me for some reason, and I, I love this guitar, but it's got issues. Anyway, anyway, pipe organs, piccolos, all that stuff. Uh, accordions, aquamarinas, uh, aqu uh, accordions, aquamarinas, not aquamarinas. I'm sorry, man. I've said this too many times. Uh, politics, world events, per your own personality problems, it's fine. Call on the show. We're here for you, but keep it clean. This is a family program. Okay. Well, well tell us what kind of a guitar we see you with tonight. Well, this year is a Taylor... Uh, it says a 714 CE, I think. Let me see. It says inside there. Oh. Can't see that far. Um, <laughs> anyway, it's a Taylor. Yeah. Yeah, 714 CE, which means it's a, seven, it's a 700 series. It's a 14. Or is, it, or is it a 14 and it's a 7 series? It's a cedar top. has a Fishman blender. Hey. If there is a hum, it's barely noticeable in the control room. Oh, good. So I think it would be okay. Uh, and did we mention B flat, A, and C clarinets? Uh, not, uh, not yet. Okay. Well, okay. We'll, uh, <laughs> I guess we'll have to mention those later then. Oh, you just did. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And we didn't get to zithers yet either. Zithers and xylophones and uh, there's no such there's there's no aardvark. Uh, is there, there's no instrument that has two A's in the front of it. I don't think. Uh, accordion is the lowest one I can think of. Huh. Accordion, uh, I, I, I assume the ABE or I didn't a, bring the Google machine tonight. Yeah, yeah we'll shoot. Have to, have to research that. I could probably find out on my phone, but I think that's in the car, so I, I know. If, if it's Tuesday night, if a shrewd viewer out there has an idea. Yeah. Well, I should look at my uh, musical dictionary and see if there's any instrument that I don't know. If, if you're listening to us on Friday, the show's perfected by then. We don't take calls. But. That's right, yeah. By that time, it's had a chance to simmer and mellow like a fine, uh, like a fine cheese. French cheese. Anyway, so yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, I did my whole intro. I just said politics, world events. You know, we're here for you. Keep it clean. It's a family program. All right. Yeah, this is a, a Taylor acoustic electric. I'm not exactly sure what year I got this. I think it might be 2002 or 2001, right, but right around there. Uh, now I remember. That was the last time I heard Pierre Pensasan play before he came. I, sorry, I heard him play uh, uh, the spring, I think. Uh, it was a cold night, I believe, and I uh, saw him. I hadn't seen him in over in a dozen years or so, and so I, uh, the last time I saw him play, I was disappointed with my acoustic electric guitars, and so I, I went out and bought this one. It's, just, you know, it's very expensive. It's made in California. But, you know, the thing is, okay, at home sometimes, maybe it's electronics needs to be, need to be uh, replaced or something, um, and the guy here won't do it. I maybe have to send it back to California where it was built or something someday, but the guitar itself is fine, and... Uh, the thing about like blowing all your money on a guitar, this is my justification, is they last. Yeah. Well, if you've had that one for 12 years. Yeah. And it's been having these ups and downs electronically. I have another one I had, a 12-string guitar I got about the same time. I needed a neck set, which, you know, cost me like almost $200 to do. Take the neck off and put it back on the right because it was, you know, it's a lot of pressure on 12 strings. It's fine. It's darkened with age. Its electronics are fine, but, the, you know, the neck had a little problem, but it was easy to fix, relatively easy to fix. And that was, of course, quite expensive, but it was built you know, in California. And it's a really decent 12-string guitar. So it's lasted. Um, and I was also trying to impress upon somebody uh, that's like yesterday, the uh, day before yesterday, I don't know, one, the other day, um, to get a decent instrument you know, to start with. Because I pointed to a guitar that was hanging on the wall that I still play sometimes, and it still plays fine. But uh, we, we bought it in, uh, I was with my, my family, I was a kid, uh, in Spain in 1971. And it still plays fine, you know. And of course, I have one hanging on the one wall, built 1930, 
And another one hanging on another wall, which is a little bit of work, but it still plays, and it was uh, like 1822, uh, give or take a year or two, but just right, right in there, the early 1820s. Uh, circa 1822, or 18, you know, the first half of the 1820s. Probably not as old as like 1819, but certainly not built after 1825, so. If our viewers want to see a story about a tailor that couldn't be fixed, mm -hmm. they can search for United Brakes Guitars on YouTube. That's right. Yeah, he, uh, he, he did really well. He got two, two free uh, tailors out of that. He, uh, he smashed up his guitar. It was a nice from, one, too. From Taylor, nothing from United. Well, United was offered to give him uh, some money, you know, to, to <laughs> yeah. take down the video. To, touched, yeah. But they, but they said, uh, uh, they, he said, well, they were willing to give him like $900 or something for, for like a $4,000 or $3,000 tailor. And quite honestly, I think these were retail like 2700 or something like that for this one. This is not the top of the line. Uh, it has the same quality. It just doesn't have all the, like, Mother Pearl inlay on it. It's, a, it's the, uh, you know, the more basic model. Of the this. instrument's the same. It doesn't yeah. have as much decoration. Right. I mean, it's all solid wood. It's got the fancy electronics. It's just not the um, top of the line. I think his was the top of the line with all the pretty inlays and everything on it. Uh, but uh, he... Uh, yeah, so they were going to give him the very modest. Well, originally they were going to give him nothing. Yeah, nothing. Yeah. Told him good luck with that. Yeah. So when they told him to take his video down, he said good luck with that. Yeah. They offered to give him a bunch of money to take down the video, but at that time he'd been a, a sensation. Yeah. Anyway. And Taylor had replaced his guitar for him. Yeah. Twice, apparently. That's a good. Uh, Good advertisement for Taylor. Because not only do they make a nice guitar, but they care. Whereas United Airlines, on the other hand. That's right.
out of tune. So for those who missed the opportunity to see us live at Uptown Bills last week, oh, yeah. where can they see you this week? Oh, yeah, well, uh, this week I'll be, uh, uh, actually, actually, I've got a great big shindig coming up on Friday at the Sheraton Hotel, but it's a, it's a party, it's a like, reception, it's a formal thing, maybe a banquet and everything. So it's not open to the public. No, no, it's a, at least 200 people are going to be there, though, so... Um, it's a doctor is being honored, some uh, head of a department and a big time uh, doctor. Um, so I, I will be. I won't be in, in Kelowna, as usual. I mean, as, as my. Well, no, I'm usually in Kelowna, so. Uh, I, this like, Friday you won't be. Yeah, and I say I won't be in Kelowna on Thursday, as usual, because I never oh. um, played in Kelowna on Thursday. But I won't be there on Friday, um, as I usually am. Yeah, that's better. Uh, so uh, if you want to hear me Friday in Kelowna, you uh, better <coughs> pick some other Friday, like, uh, like the next week. Uh, but I'll be there Saturday. And um, normally I like to say that I start at, uh, supposed to start at 6, I start at 6.30. I started before 6 last Saturday. I made it for a very long day. And that's the Tuscan Moon. Tuscan Moon, yeah, yeah. Tuscan Moon in beautiful downtown Kelowna. Um, I'll be, uh, yeah, I'll be there. Make a reservation. Uh, this is sort of that in between, b before the holidays thing. So you might, uh, you might get right in if you don't make a reservation, but you might have to wait for a table for a while. If you, if you don't, it depends because it's kind of that in between thing. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, anyway, and I'll be at the Journey Church on Sunday. And this week, the Journey Church is doing something a little different. Uh, they're going to have like a run, walk, or a hike, and a walk, or whatever, or a run, uh, 5K. That's part of their, uh, their worship service now. I'm there. I'm the, the, the music guy there, I guess. I'm not even religious, but it's, a, it's my Sunday gig. Um, but what's going to happen is those who want to stay behind and don't want to run or walk five kilometers, um, I will uh, perform for them. Uh, during that time. And I have this guitar synthesizer, uh, which reminds me, I'd better get there early. You uh, play Born to Run? I should play Born to Run. Baby, we were born to run. They were, no, I, uh, uh, but I'll uh, run on an empty, no, that's a, uh, uh, did you run, 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 did you run? I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, but I'm gonna do, uh, I'm gonna do special music uh, for those who lag behind. And. Uh, It's kind of uh, yeah. yeah. Meet you on a Sunday. <laughs> Heart stood still. To do run, run. To do run. To do run, run, run. Yeah. Meet you on a Sunday. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, uh, but anyway, yeah. So I'm going to do that. Um, and uh, of course, it's open to anybody who wants to go there. It's the Journey Church. It's off Oakdale Boulevard, right there. Where there, there's a railroad uh, office that had a sculpture of a train in front of it. There, I guess it's closed now. But they were going to try to get that, uh, try to get that train to oh, Chicago. Oh, Amtrak. Yeah. It should be great, by the way. Terry Branstead uh, vetoed it, though, when he came into power. He uh, didn't want to pay for it. But uh, that would be, that'd be great, though. I mean, because I think how many people go to, to and from Chicago all the time. You look around Iowa City, you see a lot of Illinois license plates. Yeah. I mean, if they would... Well, uh, there, there are more students from Cook County, Illinois, over at this university than from any county in Iowa. Yeah, well, there you go. T. So they could use the train, and then, uh, and I would use the train. I could go to Chicago without, because I hate driving to Chicago. A guy told me he goes to Chicago sometimes for like uh, meetings and stuff, but what he does is he drives to some little town in Illinois that is on the Amtrak, yeah. and he parks his car in their gravel parking lot, and he gets on the, hops on the train there, takes the train into Chicago, and it's like really cheap uh, train fare, and then he parks for free in their gravel parking lot. And then, you know, once he gets into Chicago, he uses public transportation. And, uh, yeah. you know, so anyway. So you can, uh, if you can drive to wherever that is in Illinois, you can get a ticket. Oh. Yeah. I, I took the train from Macomb. Macomb's on the Amtrak to Chicago. Uh -huh. Took the train a couple times from there up to Chicago. Mm -hmm. In the olden days, yeah. when I was young and the world was new, yeah. I was in the service and used to take the Rock Island Rocket from between Peoria and Chicago. Huh. Then either the North Shore Line, I can't remember what the, there were two commuter lines mm -hmm. that ran from 
Chicago up to Great Lakes. Hmm. North Shoreline was one of them, but I can't remember. Chicago Northwestern, I think, was the other one. Mm-hmm. Well, when I was a little kid, um, we used to ride, you know, rails. I mean, trains, take yeah. trains places. Uh, that kind of, like, disappeared while I was still a little kid. Yeah. And, uh, of course, in Europe, you take a train a lot. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of... Having a car in Chicago is kind of a drag. I mean, if you... You know, if you if you go there and you're staying in a hotel and they have a hotel parking lot yeah. or a parking ramp underneath it or something like that, you of course you pay a lot of extra money and stuff. But, and you don't really want to park on the street for very long. Well, and, you, and most of the time you can't anyway. Yeah. You have to find a parking lot. Yeah. So, anyway. But anyway, so uh, I'm getting off the topic though. The Journey Church is right there where that that uh, their office was yeah. for this. They have a sculpture. It's easy to find. Anyway. Uh, they, they called that the Rock Island rocket. That was diesel in, in the 70s. Mm-hmm. They got one of those turbines, oh, really? fat, fast train. Mm-hmm. And the thing would go like 90 mile an hour. Mm-hmm. But, but they found out real soon their track couldn't handle a train yeah. going 90 mile an hour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the problem. In Europe, of course, they've, uh, you know, they take uh, much better care of their tracks or they yeah. build them better and everything like that. But they, they're much newer. But they've invested a lot more yeah. money into them. I'm sure we could do the same thing here, but the only thing is that it's much more densely populated yeah. there than it is here. So Yeah, they're, those, those European countries are like our eastern states. Right. A lot of cities close together. Right. And uh, out here in the... That's what, that was, I was I, talking about Dvorak when he was in Spillville, Iowa. Yeah. He looked out his back window, and there's this expansive prairie. It blew his mind, you know, yeah. being from... Uh, Prague or whatever, and, and you know, hanging around Berlin and, right. and Europe in general, he was like, wow, you know, but, um, <laughs> anyway.
I, uh, I've been thinking about this. I haven't played this guitar for, for a while, actually. It's been hanging on the wall, getting dusty. And uh, I have several other steel string guitars that, uh, with pickups in them. And uh, this one, if it's not humming on me or giving me trouble, it's probably the best one for playing. I've got a loud one, which is really good, but the pickup thing isn't. Uh, well, it's pretty good, but it's not as good as this. Um, but anyway, the thing is that, uh, you know, I, I normally have been playing nylon string guitars uh, the last few weeks. I have done a lot of messing around with hollow body electric guitars, like jazz guitars, and um, guitars that may be hollow bodies that are suitable for playing jazz. Maybe they also, you know, favored by rock and uh, blues musicians. And then, of course, there's always my solid body guitar collection I keep messing with. But, uh, but lately I've been doing mostly nylon and then some hollow bodies on the side, you know. Um, and I keep thinking, I, I like the sound of a steel string. It's just that it's not really in my ear. It's not really in my head lately. And I, so I might be driving back from someplace listening to the radio in the car, to like KUNI, the station out of the uh, University of Northern Iowa. And you know, I'll hear some sort of contemporary uh, kind of fancy kind of, wouldn't exactly call it folk music, but, you know, something. And, and there'd be a steel string guitar in there being well played. And I thought, wow, man. I thought, wow, you know, that's cool. Wait a minute. I can do that better. Yeah, well, I can do that. I don't like to say I can do that better. That's another one. Like, I can do that. Because like, I can do it better is another punchline for that guitar joke. But, uh. So last week I, I, I mentioned a few jokes. Uh, on the show, on that uh, coffee house show, and then that night I went home and uh, and because uh, I had been working on this file, I've been looking around for them on the internets and collecting them, and I uh, I, I started uh, I had this collector type of mentality, kind of hoarding type of mentality, so I started collecting well, jokes. You that with guitars and amps. Yeah, guitars and amps and stuff like that. I have uh, many many more. Guitars and amps or jokes? Uh, jokes now. And, and uh, I have no, no more guitars and amps than you, than you last saw me. In fact, I'm thinking about trading. Uh, one, you've been in remission this week. In remission this week. I'm thinking about actually trading uh, one electric guitar and two amps in and trying to get a tenor guitar, uh, which uh, West Music has actually in stock. Uh, you don't know the tenor guitar. It's a four-string guitar, tuned like a viola, or as I prefer, Mendel. Well, no, it's, it's, not, it's not the ukulele because the ukulele is in fourths. This is in fifths. So it's, it looks like an overgrown baritone ukulele with metal strings. But it's actually a tenor guitar. So it's a different animal. Because uh, uh, as a tenor, it's tuned like a tenor banjo. So, so I, I went, went to the music store and, and uh, I was for... I don't forget what I was there for. Probably nothing, no good reason. But the um, so manager came out. Because they see me coming, they think, oh, there's a live one. You know? and, uh, and so I said, well, what do we have this new around? Oh, yeah. And he shows me this, uh, this little tenor guitar. And I've never owned one, but I, I, I have a tenor banjo, which needs about $400 worth of work, actually. But, and I used to play tenor banjo because I had another one that broke. And uh, anyway, it's a long story. It's boring. Okay. Actually, all this stuff is really boring. So the guy, he was, uh, you know, he, it was tuned properly, but he wasn't uh, sure if it was tuned that way. And he was a familiar with, like, is it, do they tune it like the first four strings of a guitar, which is how a baritone ukulele is tuned? And uh, I said, no. It's tuned in fifths, like a, like a viola or a, mando, a mandola, which is more my speed, you know, because I'm more likely to tune a mandola than a viola. So it's like, it's like a violin, but everything's a fifth lower. So anyway, also all the fingering is different, but it's the same as man mandolin fingering, except everything is, you know, lower. So, I mean, but you can use the same fingering, you're just in a different key. So, okay. so I picked the thing up and immediately knew how to play it because, you know, because I played tenor banjo on and off for the last 30 years. So, anyway, uh, and that, that sort of got me interested. And, uh, and then he was wondering what, you know, what, what the origin of this was and, and, and uh, also wondering about Irish tuning. And Irish tuning, I don't know if they ever played tenor banjo in, in uh, Ireland, or tenor guitar in Ireland, but they played tenor banjo. And the Irish tuning, as they say, is actually like a, a mandolin tuning, only an octave lower. So it's not tuned like a tenor banjo, it's tuned like, a, uh, like, a, um, like an octave mandolin, which is something else I happen to know. So, and then, uh, but he wondered what, you know, where this instrument comes from or what it's, you know, because it's, it's not very, it's very rare now. 
And, and I happen to know that, you see. These are the things that make your eyes glaze over when if you meet me at a party. Well, this is a guitar show. Presumably, if we have an audience out there, yeah. there are some guitar nerds. That's right. Well, if you want to know about tenor guitars, and they're, they sound really cool. They're different. It's a different voice from an ordinary guitar. Um, but in the 1920s, banjos were very, very popular. And they had been popular for, you know, 50 or, or 80 years before that. But they had reached a sort of pinnacle of uh, popularity at the, at the turn of the century. And then by the 1920s, they were quite popular, and they were the, the jazz, um, the chord. Old, old Dixieland bands had a banjo in them. Yeah, they had a banjo, and, they, and all the jazz <coughs> bands, and, and the, uh, sometimes they called Dixieland, but there's other kinds of jazz, too, at that time, but they all had, like, banjos. And then and the, and the playing the bass was usually a tuba, although sometimes they had, like, you know, bass, double bass saxophones or clarinets playing the, the, uh, the bass part, but a lot of times it was a tuba. So around about 1926, styles changed, and... Uh, the, uh, the tuba and the banjo were jettisoned from the jazz band in favor of the string bass and the guitar. And they started building guitars bigger and louder. So uh, uh, there are all these banjo players, you know, who mostly play the tenor banjo. Uh, and there's also a plectrum banjo, and we can talk about that later. But, I, uh, you know, anyway, so you can just, if you were to play the tenor banjo, you can just pick up a tenor guitar and all the fingerings are the same. It might be a little bit different, striking it, holding it might be a little different, and, and, and the, 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 the response, you know, from a wooden box instead of like a drum, you know, which is what a banjo is, is a drum with strings on it. The response would be a little different, but, you know, you'd have all the, you, all the chords you know, all everything you know how to play on the tenor banjo translates immediately to the tenor guitar, because it's the same thing. So I told him that, and he didn't know that, and he seemed like he might be slightly interested, but of course he's a manager of a music store, so, and he's trying to sell tenor guitars, so now he knows. Anyway, that's what makes people like me boring at parties. That's why if I'm at a party, you hire me to play the guitar, and don't let me do anything but play guitar. Don't let me say anything, because I'll start fixing people with my glittering eye like the ancient don't mariner. Ask me how guitar works. Yeah, because yeah, I'll tell you about guitars. But anyway. But, uh, and the other thing, along those lines, slightly different, but uh, I, I, was, uh, I, been, I was talking to a guy, a banjo student last night, about you know, being a about old age, you know, like, like living a really long time. And I told him that I, I wanted to uh, you know, grow a long beard, white beard, and have it like pointed, wear bib over overalls, and play a uh, four-string, nylon-string banjo. Uh, and I could be somewhere as an exhibit, you know, because I could, I think that'd be the last thing to go. So the, the banjo, a baritone banjo lele, and this is not unlike, you know, early banjos for a certain era in the 19th century. Um, and so I looked it up, and, they, and actually Gold Tone, which is, a, I think, the made in China, makes a baritone banjo lady. So what it is, is the first four strings of a guitar, you know, nylon, uh, on a banjo. You know, about, you know, smaller than a guitar. But, you know, the size, it's, a, it's a baritone ukulele banjo. So it's bigger than a, a, the regular banjo lady, which is quite small. But it's, uh, you know, smaller than a guitar. And I was thinking, and the, the neck would be a little bit wider than, than a, like a banjo, like a tenor banjo neck would be, uh, to accommodate the nylon strings. And I think it would be very easy to play. Um, and, you know, I, I, baritone ukulele, uh, which once again is tuned the same as, a, you know, it's like a tenor guitar is tuned like a tenor banjo. With a t baritone banjo lele is tuned like a baritone ukulele. And baritone ukulele is the first uh, instrument I bought with my own money when I was a kid. I bought... Uh, Baritone uke for twelve dollars, or for ten dollars when I was twelve, and uh, used from a, from a music teacher, school system, a woman, and and she, I think it's about, about 1958 vintage, uh, Sears Silvertone, and I still have it, and it still plays just fine. In fact, it plays just the same as it did when I bought it in like 1969. So, you know, I thought, well, you know, if I if I'm really old, I'm starting to go. Maybe I can't do all this like. <laughs> I'm 90, 100 years old, something like that. But maybe I can do the. Or, oh my darling, oh my darling, oh my darling, Clementine. He was lost and gone forever, dreadful sorry, Clementine. Or when Shaky's Pizza Parlor used to all have a piano player and a banjo player doing sing along songs. Yeah. Well, they had a. They had a band in the Shakey's Pizza here a long time ago when I was a kid. 
And I went up and I talked to the, uh, to the young woman. Uh, well, she was, she was at least 10, 15 years older than me, but, uh, but she, she played the, uh, the banjo in the, in the group. And I think she played plectrum banjo. And I didn't know much about it. I played a little bit of, um, I started playing five string a little bit when I was 16. And uh, cause I had a friend who had one. I used to go over to his house and uh, I can't remember his name. I keep trying to, I gotta look him up because he actually, he died uh, like a year later. Because he's, he's older than me, like a year older than me. So uh, when I was a senior in high school, that's when the year that Saigon fell. And, uh, and he had joined the military because he graduated from high school, joined the military. And he was killed in a, in a helicopter, was shot down in the Mayaguez operation, which was like the last battle of the U.S. was in the Vietnam War. They, uh, I guess the North Vietnamese seized a ship and then Americans went to seize it back. I don't know exactly what the story was, but it was the last battle of the Vietnam War as far as the U.S. was concerned. And, uh, and he was killed in that. And I, I, I keep, I mean, I remember his face. And of course, I remember the face of a kid, you know. Uh, and he was a pretty good friend. I used to go over to his house and play guitar with him. And we were sitting there, I was playing guitar. He was playing a banjo. He says, let's, let's switch. So I don't know how to play one of these things. It was only one way you're gonna learn. So I picked up the banjo and started playing, tried to play. He showed me a couple things and I, I figured it out. I was a finger picker. I mean, I played classical guitar. That was my main you know, focus. So of course you finger pick a five string banjo. And so it came kind of naturally to me. I learned a few chords and then I could just sort of play along. I said, wow, I can do this. I, I mean, I had to learn the chords because they're different from the guitar chords, um, different tuning. But um, yeah, but then I, uh, so then I, uh, you know, that's when I started playing banjo, I guess. Uh, but that's five string, which is a different animal altogether. And uh, anyway, so that's my reminiscences, I guess. But uh, anyway, I'd like to get a, a baritone banjo lately. Actually, my tenor banjo that I have, I put classical guitar strings on it and had it as a baritone banjo lately. Uh, the neck was going on it. Uh, I mean, it needs a neck set. It needs to be kind of taken apart and put back together, so it's going to be a lot of labor. Because uh, the neck is going forward like this, which happens. And that's what happened to my, uh, my other one that I had years ago, my tenor banjo. Um, but see, the thing is that, that to get it fixed, it's probably like $400. Because it would be like, you know, 60 bucks an hour and, and many hours of work. And so that's the estimate. Maybe, you know, 350 or something. But I mean, you know, it's going to be up there. Uh, but when it hanging on the wall, as a curiosity, it's free. And, uh, it's paid for and not eating anything. Yeah, and I loosen the strings down pretty well, so it's not gonna, you know, yeah. get any worse. So, um, but I mean, I would like to have a, a tenor banjo, and I'd like to have a tenor guitar, but I'm really interested in a, in a baritone banjo lately. I think that'd be kind of fun. And I mean, I could immediately play one. I wouldn't have to, I mean, I know how to play a tenor banjo uh, and a tenor guitar. Although I get a little confused sometimes, it's like a mental thing. Uh, but baritone banjo lately, I could pick one up right now and I would be fluent on it. I would be like getting it for free, you know? It's like, uh, you know, like if you, if, you, uh, if you drive a Chevy and then you go rent a car and it's a Ford, you know, there's not much in the way of a learning curve. You know, it's like the same thing exactly. I mean, you know, so what? Yeah, yeah there's some, I know. For a long time, my wife and I both drove GM cars, so mm -hmm. everything worked the same. It was in the same place. Mm -hmm. And then she got a Dodge, and everything was backwards. Oh, yeah. It's, it's yeah. like going from a PC to a Mac. Yeah, well, going from a PC to a Mac or vice versa is more difficult, I think, than a, uh, you know, a Chevy to a Dodge. But I, uh, I mean, I got a car uh, beginning of the summer, and, and it was, uh, you know, so I went from a Honda to a Dodge. And uh, it was a little bit different in some ways, things I didn't quite understand. It took like well over a day to really familiarize myself with it. And, uh, you know. Well, it's like when, when we go away, we, we go in her car, and when we come back, I get in mine and try to shift gears with the yeah. windshield right. washer. Yeah, right. Well, that's, that's, that's the problem, yeah. And I still do that. And things, I, I had a Plymouth for, for 10 years. I had a Plymouth Neon. And in order to pop the trunk, I had to reach down the seat and grab a, a little lever, yeah. you know. And uh, but now it's a button 
under the dashboard. So sometimes I'll still reach down for that, that, uh, that lever. Yeah. The thing is I sold that car in 2008, you know. So, I mean, I'm, I'm having this flashback. Se senior moments. Well, the thing is there's a lot of stuff in my mind, right? And, uh, and, and I'm very interested in the way the brain works in any, in any case, you know, because I'm trying to get, you know, as much bang for the buck with this poor thing here that I have. Um, in my defense, I'll say that I didn't ever, like, you know, uh, never like a skid row drunk. I never sniffed glue recreationally and tried to stay away from solvents and stuff. So, you know, basically my brain is intact. You know, it's not badly damaged, I wouldn't think, but normal wear and tear. But, but I'm interested in the way it works because, like, like, I'll be playing these gigs, you know, and somebody will ask me to play a song. And I, maybe I know this song, or I've played it, but I haven't actually played it in years. And, uh, like, one song that, uh, you know, I, I had been working on, but I forgot about it. Because I, I was working on it uh, in the last fall, and uh, this, or maybe it was the year before, but it was killing me softly with his song because I was making a nice little guitar solo, you know. And then when the Christmas season came around, I kind of forgot about it because I was trying to remember all my Christmas songs. And uh, and then a side note, I failed to play Frosty the Snowman on the first try last night because I, you know, I don't have my Christmas thing in my mind at all because uh, I play a lot of Christmas songs during you know the season, but. So somewhere like in the, you know, May or something, June, I tried to play Killing Me Softly with this song. I couldn't remember anything about it at all, like what key I was doing it in. And then, and then you know, and then like the next night I was sitting there thinking, oh yeah. <laughs> it up, but I kind of remembered it. And this other song somebody wanted me to do, The Autumn Leaves. I thought, I've never really done, I mean, uh, a year or so ago, or maybe two years ago, I don't know, um, we did an upstairs coffee house show, and uh, various members of the Tribbles, of the band, you know, uh, and, and Joy Walker, who's the string bass player, uh, was going to play the, the, she played the, uh, uh, the melody yeah. on the string bass with the bow of The Autumn Leaves, you know. So, so I'm sitting there, you know, doing this gig, and it's been like, you know, a year or so, or maybe two years. I can't remember what, when that was. I think it was in the fall, though, because it was in the autumn. Um, and I played the chords to it. But I, so I'm sitting there. But see, this is, this is my, was my second gig on Saturday. And I, you know, my first gig, I played at a wedding, uh, for a wedding. So I played, you know, processional, meditation, recessional, and everything. I played the prelude music and the postlude music. And the prelude, it was a little delayed, so I played, you know, for, 45, 50 minutes or something like that before it. And uh, so I did, and then I went and played the gig and I showed the gig early so I, I started like 45 minutes earlier than I usually do. So I started like quarter to six and I played till 9.30. So somewhere about, you know, I don't know, nine o'clock or something like that. Somebody wants me to play the autumn leaves. And by the time I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm gone mentally, but you see the thing is I can play guitar as long as I don't try to speak or think about anything. You know, I mean, somebody asked me what I want for dinner. That's a difficult question. But then I was thinking, like, uh, like. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
remember that that was the week before that was that happened, and I was trying to play this last week on the show. I did about as good a job as I, I should sit down and practice it. Yeah, you gotta come to rehearsal one of these times. Yeah, I should, I suppose. Yeah. Anyway, I'm just fooling around with this guitar. Yeah. Same time, I've got that black guitar behind me, but I haven't uh, even picked it up. I'll be back next week. I can, you know. Bring a black guitar then. I suppose. If any luck, I won't have bought another guitar by then. And <laughs> might have a new guitar to show us by next week, huh? This one might end up in the shop being fixed.
all just tune in. That's uh, it's tuning something we call double D. And it was uh, actually there are three D strings on the guitar this way. Uh, so I tuned the two outside E strings down to D and let the rest of the guitar the same. That was my, my take on fingerstyle guitar. I just sort of made that up based on a couple things I used to play. Um, so the joke, which I told last week, was uh, the fingerstyle guitar player, or, you know, guitar player gets up at a fingerstyle guitar festival and plays something. It's just beautiful. People go around and say, wow, man, what was that tuning you were using? E, A, D, G, B, E. And the joke is, of course, that's, that's the standard tuning for guitar. But fingerstop players always like retune their guitars. So that, that song I just played had a, uh, you know, alternate tuning. And it sounded very different from the other things I'd play, you know. We were talking about that in the show last week. I was still thinking about this subject. Is is jokes that they're funny if you, you know, if you know something about the subject. It's inside jokes. Right. Like the, like a Zen master goes up to the hot dog stand and says, "Make me one with everything." Because you know that's not me holding I mean, I say, "Make me one." I want to be one with everything. So that's a joke. I said the best joke I know. Um, Anyway, so, I mean, I guess I know a lot of jokes, but I mean, there are a lot of them, you know. What do you call a guitar player who breaks up with his girlfriend? Homeless. That's right, of course. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, there are some really stupid ones, you know. You tell, how can you tell if the stage is level? Well, the drummer has drool coming out of both sides of his mouth. You know? But I, I don't think I like drool jokes that much. Like, like you helped me out with that one banjo player joke. Or the banjo player get on his IQ test. Barbecue sauce. Exactly. You see what I mean? That's a good joke. Because there's sort of there's a home there's a homey thing about that, you know. You could really imagine a banjo player having barbecue sauce on you know, his fingers and stuff. Anyway. Um, but you know, the one I've told this joke, nobody uh, I've told all of them all these students of mine. And uh, I'm going to try to, I'm going to tell it to a, I'm going to go about to co again next week. If I see another faculty member up in the, in the hall, I'm going to tell them this joke and see if they get it. Uh, but it's the, uh, um, so a guy is a banjo player, or no, he's a bluegrass guitar player, excuse me. Bluegrass guitar player, uh, he wants to uh, take his music more seriously, so he tries to enroll in a conservatory. They give him a little quiz and say, what is a subdominant of C? And he stands there looking blank. They said, don't you know what a subdominant is? He said, well, yeah, but I thought it was C. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, so far, nobody's gotten that joke. Now, I don't expect you to get it, because you're not necessarily a student of music. Right. Yeah. But, uh, On the other hand, our director probably knows what that means. He knows what it means, but he didn't get it either, because he, he, didn't, he comes from the other angle. He knows what a subdominant is, but he didn't know that a bluegrass musician would only play in the key of G or something, or that that would be a stereotype. So, you know. Anyway. I'll be back next week. I think we've been on this Taylor guitar. Though.